in our praises and there's the reminder that we need him we need him so desperately not just sunday mornings not just every once in a while but we need him every single hour so we're gonna close our worship set with hymn number 382 i need thee every hour second graders who would like to go to children's church miss ashley is in the back waiting on you you are dismissed at this time welcome again everyone as we move through Ephesians, we're coming to the close. We're going to be in Ephesians chapter 6 today, if you want to find your way there. Chapter 6. I'd like to start out with just reading uh, our short passage today. It's Ephesians 6, 10 through 13. 
And we will get started with that. Ephesians 6.10 starts with, Finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of His might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all to stand firm. Let's pray. Father, as we look through this text, we recognize that we need your wisdom. We need your abilities and strength and the life that you've given us. I pray that you would just give us your insight. Give us hearts that can be moved by you today for your glory and our good. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, as we get into this passage today, uh, it's interesting that up to this point in recent weeks, it's been uh, that uses the idea of uh, therefore walk, therefore walk, therefore walk over and over again. Uh, but now instead of therefore, even though it falls into that context, it, it uses the term Finally, when it says finally, it's, it's not just like the preacher trying to land the plane, right? He, he's not doing that. When he uses this term finally, it has a really important meaning. And the important meaning here is when he says finally, he, what he's really saying, in light of everything that I've taught you up to this point, I'm bringing all of this into a capstone. I'm bringing all of this teaching of the letter of Ephesians all into one final conclusion here so as he says this the context is the whole letter is brought to bear if you miss that part of it you're going to think that he just set a separate thing aside but it but it's not it lands in in light of everything that he said to this point uh, and one of the commentators he just listed it and I thought he did a nice job and he says this in light of everything that's been said he says he's bringing this to this point in light of all that God has done for you, as he describes in the book of Ephesians, as we can go back to chapter 1, every spiritual blessing in Christ Jesus has been given to us in heavenly places. So he's saying everything that Jesus has done, and if you go back and see what he's done, and remember the, the highlighting of the in Christ passages, Throughout those first three chapters, in Christ this, and in Christ this, and in Christ. And the grace that has ex been expressed in Christ. In light of that, that gets us a start. In light of the glorious standing you have as a child of God, it says that we are seated with Him in heavenly places. You have a position in Christ that is unprecedented. You've been brought from death to life. You've been brought into this new building, this body, this church. This family is what you've transitioned from into. In light of that, in light of his great plan of the ages that God has made you part of, the thing that no one had known about until the church came on the scene and God revealed to Paul, this new entity is neither Gentile nor Jew. It's the church. In light of that, in light of the plan for Christian maturity and growth that he gives you. To not leave you as just a newborn in Christ. But to take you and grow you up and to build you up in light of that. In light of the conduct that he calls you to live. Every believer to live. To walk in a manner worthy of the calling of Christ Jesus. To walk it out. In light of the filling of the Holy Spirit. In the light of all of this, there is a battle to fight for the Christian life. There is a battle to fight. Now, it's interesting that the, the title I used today was called a combat, particularly for uh, a Mennonite background church, right? Uh, typically, we, we avoid this, this construct of war. Uh, and, but the reality is, and this passage says that every one of you, every one of us who have claimed Jesus Christ as our Savior have been conscripted into the battle. 
There's no exception. If you are in Christ, you have been called to spiritual combat. That means you have to be prepared to go. As I was telling my Sunday school class when I was 18 years old, <clears throat> you know, I had to sign up for selective services. That means that, that, that should the government didn't need to choose to bring you into the military service, that they could, have, they could do that if you were signed into that. I'm glad I don't have to, I'm past that age now, that I don't have to worry about that. But I try to imagine those who were conscripted, those who were drafted, and they went off to training, and some went off to combat. What that does in your mind when suddenly you've been called to bear and to go to war. I think the temptation for us as Christians is to maybe relegate this idea to maybe not really true to us or maybe other places, other people have spiritual warfare going on, but not really us. As we get into this, we're going to see how he teases this idea out. He says, finally, be strong in the Lord in the strength of his might. <clears throat> Interesting statement here. Be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might um, is maybe not the best translation. This is the ESV uh, because he has the idea that I'm just supposed to suddenly find strength, right? I'm just supposed to be the strong person in the Lord. Um, it's better to be state, be strengthened because it's the passive form of this verb, which means somebody is acting upon you. Somebody's power is coming to you. It's the idea that um, it's not your own and you don't get it on your own, but you have to be somehow involved. Somehow in this, somehow this is a, a joint effort to be strengthened. You and the God of the universe are coming together in this combat space, in this preparation space. So you, when, you're ready to, when you're ready to go to war, you have what you need in this. And so there's, it's interesting. Just take these pieces. It says be strong or strengthened in the Lord. The, the purpose here is what does it mean to be in the Lord? How do you be strengthened in the Lord? Well, the concept here is that you have a place and a position in him already. You are in Christ. And, and if you find yourself in him and you believe that it's true, what he stated of you, then you start to realize your elevated position. He went to the cross and God said, in light of that, I'm going to raise you up. It says, and seat, seated you at my right hand in the heavenly places. That's what he did for Jesus. Far above every power and authority and anything that's out there, Jesus got seated there. And he didn't go alone because all of us who are in the Lord are placed there with him. Do you believe that? Because if you don't believe what's true about you, you are already sacrificing the strength that would be yours. That you are seated with the, the living Christ in the heavenly places. And his strength that he has there is strength that you get to put on to your life. And it says, and it's really interesting, the next term here. It says, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. The, those terms there are, uh, are not revealed well in English. But the idea here, the strength that he's talking about is used throughout the New Testament but it's never used for anything other than the power of God. In the strength or the power of God. And I think the better for this context here. Another way that that term is, is used in the New Testament is this term. It's used in the term of dominion. It's in the positional power that is his. If you are strengthened in the Lord in the dominion in which he exists. From that elevated position in the heavenly places. If you get to sit with him in that dominion space. In that power. Suddenly the strength takes on a different idea. We got an idea that you just grab your bootstraps. And the strong Christians. You know what they do is they just. They just 
double down and grit their teeth real hard and the rest of us struggle through, right? No, no. You realize that everyone who is in Christ has access to his dominion power because we are with him in that space. The power of his might that we get to access and be strong in him. This joint effort. Then he goes on to the next section here and he says, put on the whole armor of God. And that's the next point there. It's just put on. The implication is like getting dressed. Put on this armor, soldier. Do you have to put it on? Well, no, you don't have to put it on. You can, you can just say, I don't really want to be in this military position. I don't want to have to do combat. It sounds you know, unpleasant. Why can't my faith just be a pleasant thing and just happily wander around through this life until one day, you know, I just go to glory and it's all good. Well, that's not the world in which we live. We've been born into a broken world. We've been born into a world that's dying and sin has its day over and over. So he's saying, put on this, note the whole armor of God. Not just part of it. If there's a package deal. You don't want just a piece of it. I had a friend of mine from Alaska, Navy SEAL. And if you look at what a Navy SEAL, when he goes into combat, has every piece has its part and they spread every piece out. And there's literally hundreds of components to them when they gear up to go out on a mission. And every piece matters for the success of that mission. Now, he says, put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. Two pieces here you have to see. Number one is when it says you, so that you may be able. It's you, it's you plural. You see, yes, well, I'm going to go strong in my faith and I'm going to be this, this soldier for the Lord, if you will. He's not saying just you by yourself. You are a unit. You plural have to get this prepared, which which maybe speaks to the to the point of helping each other. Helping each other with the armor. I was recently talking to some gentlemen about this, and they're like, you know, one of the students were going deep into the idea of how they got dressed in the armor and and at least in the days when Paul was in prison and he maybe saw a Roman soldier, is you would have to have somebody help you with your armor. It would be something that would be nearly impossible to put on by yourself. You would have to enlist help of someone else to get you completely strapped in. So maybe this idea here is that you may be able, you all plural, be able to stand if you put on the whole armor that you may be able to stand against, and I think it's interesting here, the schemes of the devil, or the wiles of the devil, or the trickiness of the devil. To understand the nature of how the devil works on people. Do you understand how that works? Anybody here ever have a mouse in their house? What do you do with those little guys? You get a mouse trap, right? Or maybe your cat takes care of it. I don't know. Cats don't come in my house, so so you get the mouse trap out, right? You know what you put in those mouse traps? Bait, right? I don't know what you use for bait, but my favorite because it becomes this little competition to see chunky peanut butter and you lock a little piece of peanut underneath there that they can't get out easy right and they come along like oh peanut butter right delicious isn't that how the devil works he puts bait out in front of us little treats little things that oh that would be good hiding the trap isn't that how it works in part 
Well, sometimes that's how it works. Sometimes there's bait. He has schemes. A lot of times, he uses fear instead. Whispers fearful thoughts, terrifying thoughts. Maybe about yourself. Maybe about the sin that you struggle with. Maybe about the, the lie that God isn't a good God. And he, he doesn't care about you. And that your sin is too great. And you're just not enough. It's interesting that scripture talks about Satan and his wiles. And that he gives him two, two images. One is he is... He's this tempter. He's the one who's always trying to trip you up. They're always whispering in your ear. Always telling you to go one way or another, right? The, the wrong way. But the moment that you go the wrong way, he changes his role into the accuser. He says, hey, try this. And you try it. And he says, you're guilty. Not only does he tempt you into it, then, then he accuses you once you do it. There's all these ways in which he tries to get to us, and we're going to get further into that. But I'm going to read something here for you because it always hasn't been like it is today. You do realize that. The very fact that Paul gives us this detailed understanding about the spirit realm and what's going on wasn't always the case. Remember that ancient book? Well, let me just read a little bit of it and then I'll kind of hop through the story. There was a man in the land of Uz, and his name was Job. And his man was blameless and upright, and one who feared God and turned away from evil. And there were born to him seven sons and three daughters, and he possessed 7,000 sheep, 3,000 camels, 500 yoke of oxen, 500 female donkeys, and many, very many servants, so that this man was the greatest of all the people of the east. And his sons would feast every day, and they'd bring the sisters over. Verse 6 says, And now there was on a day when the sons of God, or the angels, would be another way of stating, came to present themselves to the Lord. So now we get, the, there's a pivot. We got this image of this guy, Job, who's, he's, he's got it all together. Godly guy. All the stuff on this earth. And then we take a quick jump, and we're into the heavenlies. And on a certain day, all the angels come into the presence of God. That's an interesting snap to a different location, right? And as they're there in front of the Lord, it says, Satan also came along them. And the Lord said to Satan, where have you come from? Now, it wasn't that God didn't know where he'd come from. He knows where he's at. And do you realize, biblically, that Satan, even in the present age, has access not only to planet earth and all the space around us, he also has access into the heavenlies. Job didn't know that. Job didn't know what we know. And so he's like, hey, where'd you come from, Satan? And Satan said to the Lord, I've been going to and fro on the earth, walking up and down on it. Satan says, I'm just doing my satanic duties on planet earth. And the Lord said to Satan, Have you considered my servant Job? There is none like him on the earth, blameless, upright, who fears God and turns away from evil. God's bragging on his man. Good man. Righteous. He turns away from all the stuff that you represent. And Satan says this, Well, hey, wait a second here. Does, God, does Job fear God for no reason? Have you not put a hedge around him and his house and all he has on every side? You've blessed the work of his hands and the possessions have increased. But stretch out your hand and touch all that he has and he will curse you to your face. And the Lord said to Satan, Behold, all that he has in him is in your hand. Only do not stretch out. Uh, but against him, do not stretch out your hand. So Satan went out from the presence of the Lord. You see what's going on here? We get a snapshot into the spiritual realm. And Satan's desire is to harm God's man. And they're having this discussion over it. And, and God 
let Satan know. He says, you can go touch everything that he has. But you can't touch him. And he'll curse you. He'll give up his faith in a minute if he is able to be touched. And all this stuff is touched. Well, it gives us some understanding here. One about, well, the power of Satan. Satan's desire was to destroy him, destroy his faith, destroy the relationship that they had. Notice what his intent was, is not just to see the man destroyed, but to see him curse God, to see the relationship that had been built tore down. That's what he wanted. So how did he tear it down? Well, then the story continues. There was a single day. And in that next single day, Everything that Job owned was stolen away or killed, including his ten children. You see, this indirect attack of Satan was to connect the idea that all the good stuff in this life was from God and all the bad stuff from God in this life was, well, God failed, right? That was the temptation. That somehow Job had attached to his belongings and to all the stuff of his life the goodness of God only. That God was not separate from that. And all of this happened. And in verse 20, chapter 1, it says, Job arose when all this bad news came. He tore his robe. He shaved his head. He fell on the ground and worshipped. And he said, Naked I came from my mother's womb, and naked I shall return. The Lord gave, the Lord has taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. In all of this, Job did not sin or charge God with wrong. You see, the spiritual battle was being enacted against him. And Satan had massive power. If you look at it, he had the power to move other armies. He was given the power to, to affect the weather, actually. Lightning and, and wind and all of that stuff. To test God's man. Now you need to keep this in mind about Satan and God. They are not two equals that are fighting for dominance. Notice that God said, uh, Satan, you can go and test him, but you can only go this far. You can't touch his body. And he doesn't. You see, Satan's like a, a big mean dog on a short leash. That God has the ability to lengthen that leash or not. We can see in Ephesians that God has allowed a certain element of temptation to come from the evil one on all Christians. The day turns and suddenly sons of God or the angels present themselves to the Lord and Satan comes among them to present himself before the Lord. And the Lord says to Satan, where you come from? And he's like, well, you know, just going about my Satan duties down here on earth. And the Lord said to Satan, have you considered Job? You know the one. Have you considered Job? There's nobody like him. A man who fears God turns away from evil. He still holds fast to his integrity, even though you incited me against to destroy him without reason. And then Satan answered the Lord and said, skin for skin. All that man has, he will give for his life. Stretch forth out his hand, touch his bone and flesh, he will curse you to your face. Oh. Satan has the ability, if you will, to affect physiological stuff. To take health from him. He says, you can touch him, God says, but you can't take his life. Again, the chain on the bad dog was lengthened, but not so far. And so you know the story. Job was covered with sores head to foot. So bad that you see the descriptions. He had these seeping sores. He sat down in ash and he just scraped his sores. Life. His children were gone. All of his wealth was gone. His health was gone. His wife said, curse God and die. And so his support was gone. Now I'm going to ask you one question about all of this. And Job, the rest of the book of Job is Job's wrestling with what happened between me and God. Where is God? 
Well, I mean, I, I, I thought I was living a righteous life. And the, the reality is if I'm living a righteous life, this bad stuff shouldn't happen to me, right? You see, he didn't have what we have. Let me ask you a question. If Job had had Ephesians chapter 6 that said, listen up, believer. You're in a spiritual battle. Satan is trying to sift you, to destroy you, to get between you and your God. And he is relentless. And he will not stop until the day you die. Know that it's coming. Know that that's going to be the case. Do you think that would have mattered to Job even a little bit? Do you think he would have like, oh, Satan's playing games. Satan's trying to get between me and God. Satan's trying to interrupt my faith. That's the nature of how Satan works. He didn't know that. And hence the rest of the book is like questioning Doubting, maybe my, you know, I know I haven't sinned. He says, I've been, I've been keeping short accounts with God. And his friends come along and they're like, they're good for like an, you know, a while. And then they're like, you know what, Job? We think you're lying. We think that you're actually a sinner that's good at hiding his stuff. Because if you weren't a sinner, this certainly wouldn't have happened. And they start speaking for God. They didn't see what was going on either. Be careful, folks, when you see something going on in someone's life that you're not too quick to determine what went on. Do you know whether God is allowing someone to come under intense temptation through the circumstances of this life? You don't know that. Be cautious. Maybe be like the friends the first week. Just come alongside it. And commiserate with empathy. Lift them up in prayer. You see, Satan's got schemes. And we get to see now that those are active and involved around us. So the intent here is that you may be able to stand against those schemes. That you're not unaware that this stuff is coming. Verse 12 of Ephesians 6 says, For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers and against authorities and against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in heavenly places. This is easier to understand if you get the idea that when he says we wrestle not, the idea is hand-to-hand combat. That this is face-to-face To the death kind of stuff. We don't wrestle that way against flesh and blood, which is people. You see, the temptation is to to demonize people. We do that really well in our culture today, don't we? Satan is the slippery one. Maybe it's political. Maybe it's philosophical. Maybe it's something like that. And what you do is this. You're like, oh, those Republicans or all those Democrats. If I could just give them one of these right in the kisser. You know they have it coming. They deserve it. And Satan sneaks out the back door. He says, you're not wrestling against flesh and blood. You're not wrestling. But the implication here is, you circle that contrastive but. You're not wrestling against people. Cease your hatred and your angst with people. But, that contrastive but, which says, we do wrestle. Present tense and ongoing wrestling, we wrestle against rulers, against authorities, and against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in heavenly places. Well, wait a second here. That creates a problem for me. Because I don't see that arena. I don't see that realm. I'm not like the servant of the prophet that came out in the morning and saw the the city surrounded by the Arameans. And he runs back into the prophet and says, we're surrounded. And the prophet says, oh, come on, man. Come with me. He walks him outside. He prays, God, open this guy's eyes for a second. And his eyes are open and the hills are filled with the armies of the Lord. Oh. 
he got to see and it changed how he viewed it. I don't get to see the spiritual realm. God has not given me that. But yet he has instructed me here that I do wrestle and you do wrestle and we do wrestle against all of these spiritual beings that we can't even see. Do you realize the impossibility of us being successful in that on our own? Imagine that the army of choose wherever I would find, choose some weak country, Canada. <laughs> I don't know, they're just, they're just not a superpower, okay, and they're close by. What if all of a sudden all the Canadian army were able to be invisible all at the same time? Nobody's suspecting Canada anyway, right? That's kind of that sneaky stuff, right? Canadians are sneaky that way. They look just like us. What advantage would they have being completely invisible on anybody who's just locked in seeing visible stuff? Well, everything. So here we are wrestling combat with Beings we can't see. And notice that they're given echelons of authority. Rulers, authority, cosmic powers, spiritual forces and evil. The implication is that there, there's myriads of them. Multitudes of them that have been given to this space. And they are actively at war with the body of Christ. Now the temptation on some of this is, is this is surreal. Because I can't see it, therefore, it probably isn't really happening. And so we, we just kind of poo-poo it away as if it's not even a thing. And we go about like that little mouse who loves peanut butter, right? There's this thing in his traps. You know, and cats, you know, you know, from the Disney thing, there's no cats in America type of thing. Yeah, you know, it's not real, What do you think happens to somebody who doesn't realize they're in combat, being totally unprepared for combat, and your enemy can sneak up on you, and you don't even know they're coming? What do you think is going to happen at that point? You're done. You wrestle not against people, but against these and I don't think it really matters which ones we're wrestling against or even that we will ever know which ones we wrestle against. All we know is that they have power and authority and their desire and intent is evil. Hence this present darkness. The implication is they have 100% evil intention. The spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places meaning that they have access to the realms that we don't have and you're at war with them. And they're just like their leader, Satan. And they will lie to you and lie to you and lie to you. That's just how it started. Remember the little story? Adam and Eve in the garden. Walking and talking with God. Only one rule in the whole place. Don't eat on that tree. And the snake comes along and he lies. He just lies to him. Doubt your God. Doubt that he's a good God. Doubt that he has good interest for you. Doubt that his, his instructions are valuable. Just doubt that for a while. That's all it is. He will lie to you and lie to you and lie to you. And so you better be able to check the thoughts in your minds and see, is, am I being lied to here? Because that's what he'll do all the time on all the levels. So what are you supposed to do with that? Well, you got to wrestle. How are you going to wrestle with this? Well, here's what I think. you got to engage the hostilities. you got to take this combat like it's combat. i got to confess that, that occasionally I watch these little YouTube short things. 
and I was watching a YouTube short, and I, I find it interesting. There's this, there's a little phenomenon going around, and it's, it's, you know how you have boxing matches and MMA and all of this? Well, this is not this. This is what they call a slapping contest. Have you seen that? It's incredible. They got these, these, these bowls of men that get up and they, and they stand in front of each other and they take turns whacking each other. And the, and the key is you can't flinch. You flinch, you're out, you lose. So they have to just lean out there and this beast of a man winds up and goes pow right in the kisser, right? And then if you're still on your feet, then he has to stick his face out. Well, one of those little things was this guy gets up there, and here's like he's like a 110-pound little squirrely guy. And he goes up, and he goes, <clears throat> <laughs> and the guy's like, what? <laughs> and so this little squirrely guy sticks his old chin out there. And this dude's like 300 pounds. Man, he just about takes his head off. Listen, folks, you better be ready to engage the hostilities. They're coming with their full force. They're coming with, don't be the little squirrely guy that gets his head knocked off because you weren't prepared. God has said you are in combat. Own it. It's ugly. It's brutal, it's bloody, it's painful. Go back and read Job. You never get over losing ten children in a single day. It doesn't matter that God restored all of his wealth and gave him ten more children. The wounds are real. The pain is significant. That's part of the battle. And the moment you start thinking that I'm not going to be bloodied and I'm not going to take the worst end of this, you have been tricked. That's what he does and that's what he will do until you lay down your life sometime. He'll take you all the way to the end. He might even wait on you. He might let you think that your life is just just hunky-dory, rosy, and there ain't no such thing as spiritual warfare until you get some age on you. How many pastors have done that? They just seem to be marching on through life and everything is grand. Everybody loves them. They, they write their books and everybody thinks they're fantastic. And in the end of their life, they screw it up because they thought they weren't in combat and that they would be somehow protected from all of that. As you gauge hostilities, keep this in mind. What was Satan trying to do to Job? To cause him to turn on God. If I can do whatever happens to him, he's going to turn and curse God. He's going, to, he's going to reject what God says. The devil and his minions, ranks, authorities, whatever their layers are, aim to disrupt the relationship between you and him. That you will disgrace him, that you will neglect him, that you will sometime, somehow breathe, believe the lie that you're not at war. And then something goes wrong and we turn against God. It's like, I'm so mad at God. How could he do this to me? And Satan's giggling all the way home. Because we missed it. They want to disrupt that relationship. Now, it's also important that you remember that he also wants to disrupt the relationship between Christians and other Christians. Have you ever had you know, little conflict with other Christians. Big conflict. Who do you think is winning that? Well, yeah, we forgot maybe that we're in a spiritual war. And if God's family is fighting each other, flesh and blood, God is getting disgraced. He also goes in this that Satan's idea is to get within the family. To disrupt the relationships that God has established from the garden. Husbands and wives. Parents and children. Satan in that space? You better believe it. He knows how it works. He knows how all of this thing comes together. 
And I find it quite interesting as I was going through this. Not only does he try to interrupt these relationships. He tries to substitute other relationships in its place. Worship a different God. Find a different spouse. Reject your parents. Reject your children. Reject what's going on in your life. The temptation of us is to substitute stuff. The temptation is also to ignore and disobey the commands of God. Don't eat of the tree. That's just one. And I think what Paul is saying here is he's bringing the whole of the Ephesians to context. Because we just got through a bunch of stuff in there. Uh, don't disobey the context, particularly in the area of what he just talked about. Chapters 1 through and 3. The blessings that are yours in Christ. That's where he'll go after you. You're not really blessed. You don't have all the stuff. You're not, you, know, you don't have all the health you want. You don't have all this, that, the other thing. You start to doubt that God is not good and he's not giving you everything you need. And on the other hand, you fail to walk in a manner worthy of the calling of Christ. As we say, walk in unity. Walk in truth. Walk in love, walk in light, walk in wisdom. All of these things were instructions so we can walk it out. Not only did he say we give in the Holy Spirit so you can do that. He's trying to get in that walk. He's trying to get into the blessing part. That's the schemes of the devil. And his desire is to separate you from God. And he is good at it. Verse 13 says this, therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done it all to stand firm. The implication here is there is an opportunity. There is something been given that will allow you not to fail when the time comes. Are you interested in not failing when the time comes, do you want to do this combat thing? Do you have the intestinal fortitude to do what you have to do to be God's person as he has prepared you? That's where we're headed. We're going to get into the armor next week. I would suggest you read ahead in the next verses about what that whole armor looks like. You're going to need it. We're going to need it. If you're aware of it, that will help a lot. I'm going to close with this thought right here. In 2 Corinthians chapter 10, Paul is using the idea similarly as well. How do we do this? He says, for though we walk in the flesh, we're, we're humans, right? We walk in this flesh. We are not waging war according to the flesh. The combat isn't this fleshly thing. You can be laying in a bed watching this on your computer, and be doing better combat than some of us who are up and able. We don't war according to the flesh, for the weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh. The weapons, this armor that we're going to be talking about, have divine power to destroy strongholds. Do you think Satan's been working on you? Do you think that's the case? I know there are people here that are under the gun. And you don't want to say something because it makes you seem weird. If I say that I feel like Satan has just been trying to destroy me. These tools, these armor, these things have divine power to destroy that stronghold. And we destroy these arguments and every lofty opinion raised against the knowledge of God and take it every Thought captive to obey Christ. If we put on the right stuff, wear the armor, you can't be tricked. You can't be tricked. The wiles of the devil won't, won't get through. You will not fail. You will take every one of those things and you're going to catch them before they land. You're going to take every lie that's spoken in your ear 
and you're going to say, uh, 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 that one doesn't get a land. That thought doesn't get a land here. That's not true. That's not real. That's a fabrication to make me distrust, disbelief, or act out in some way against my God. We get it. The tools are there. So please, this week, read the rest of Ephesians chapter 6. We're going to pick it up next week, and we're going to find that we're going to find the tools, the armor, the whole bit that are going to make us spiritually invincible in his power. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this information, this, this, this knowledge about what's going on in a realm that we can't see. We thank you that you have shown us what is real, what's going on, and that we don't have to be afraid. We don't have to turn in worry, turn against people, that we can simply rest in you, that we can trust you, that we can count on the power, the dominion that is yours and find strength. Thank you, Lord, that we have somewhere to turn. Thank you that you are a big and powerful and good God and have given us everything we need to live this life well and to in no way be separated from you. We thank you. We praise you for the work of Jesus. In his name we do pray. Amen. Thanks so much, Nick, for the reminder. As you're standing to join us, I want to read a verse out of Romans. As Romans is closing, there's this. I want you to be excellent at what is good and innocent of evil. And the God of peace will soon crush Satan underneath your feet. Sometimes in the midst of the battle, we need the reminder that we already know God wins. The victory is assured, not because we're strong, not because we're amazing, but because Jesus is. So let's sing together. This is hymn 526. If you'd like to use your hymnals, please grab those, and we're going to sing and remind ourselves of the victory we have in Christ.
Let's pray. Father, we give you thanks again that you and your son Jesus Christ have won the victory. And Lord, sometimes it feels like we're failing here. But in you, Lord, we will never fail. In you, we will be assured eternity, heaven, and in your presence. And Lord, I just pray that this week that you would strengthen this body, strengthen the brothers and sisters to encourage one another, to walk alongside one another, to hold each other up, to be aware of the wiles of the devil, that we would not disappoint you. Help us to that end, Lord. We just give ourselves to you again, surrender our lives to you today, in Jesus' name. Amen.